Uvedete to obrne svět. Okay, I think we're back. Uh, yeah, sorry for all those watching at home, uh, trying our best. I think I said that the last two weeks, but we are really trying our best. Let's start the sermon, shall we? Uh, in 1988, Bobby McFerrin wrote a song. Actually, it was a hit song, and he wrote this song called Don't Worry, Be Happy. Don't Worry, Be Happy. Uh, solely a cappella, and I, I bet when I said those words, don't worry, be happy, that the tune of the song started going through your head. Is that right? People are, are nodding. Yes. If I said or somebody else said it to you, you probably get it in your head. Uh, McFerrin won award after award for this song back in 1988. And many people praised him for it, and mainly because it was really simple. It was a simple message, don't worry, be happy. For many people in the world, even today, people I've talked to, people my age, older or younger, this phrase, don't worry, be happy, has actually become their life vision, or you could say their motto or their mission. That in all things and through all things, they want to not worry and instead just be happy. Don't worry, be happy. Well, as we continue on in our series in John 14 through to 17, uh, through to the first week in September, that's when we will be done, uh, Jesus is going to challenge us that perhaps don't worry, be happy, isn't the most life-enriching and soul-freeing way of having joy, true joy, even true happiness amidst grief. That's what we're going to explore this morning, having joy, True joy amidst grief. Again, Jesus is going to show us the actual answer to a real life issue. Like John 14, if you remember a couple months ago where he started with these words, do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus is realizing and has realized since before the foundation of the world that human hearts, our hearts, would be troubled with a lot of things because of the entrance of sin into our world. With sin, death was delivered into the world. Humans made in the image of God now die. This reality has actually been a visible reality for our church family the past few months. With sin, pain entered creation. Now humans, as many of us know, encounter pain. Real life issues caused by a real life problem, sin. Today, if you have your Bibles open, Jesus addresses that, addressing sin and the greatest kind of grief for the people of God, which is the absence in all things of God himself, the absence of God himself. For the disciples in this passage, Jesus is realizing that grief is abounding in their hearts, almost as if your best friend left and moved away without ever coming back to see you. This is sort of the grief that these disciples are feeling right now. As they've heard Jesus say these things, that I am going away. And now they're just beginning to believe it. I encourage you to open up your Bibles so we can follow along the same passage that Sandy read just a moment ago. John 16, 5 to 15 is where we're going to be landing today. However, like the entire Bible, however, like of any passage in the Bible, to best see it in its full light, we need to review, do a little bit of review. And so with your Bibles open, look a little bit before and see what we did last week. Last week, we actually ended the previous chapter and went into 16, right to verse 4. And we saw this glaring reality that the world will hate Jesus continually. 
And because of that, actually the world will hate also his body, the body of Christ, the church. This loving warning from Jesus helps form our entire worldview of what it means to be a Christian in the world. This warning helps protect us from surprises, from an opposing world, and comforts us to the point that we can see that the hate from the world only comes because it hated Jesus first. In this, we can actually take heart because Jesus has overcome the world, which we'll actually talk about next week as we end this chapter. In John 16 and 17, which are the last two chapters in this series, We see Jesus zooming in on real-life issues, and his solutions to these issues come in full visibility in the Trinitarian God that we follow and worship and treasure. Today, the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing an answer to our grief forever. So with Bibles open, let's look at John 16. John 16, 5 is where we will start. But let's actually start at verse 4 to get the whole picture of this verse. A verse that we saw last week. Starting at verse 4. It says, I have told you this, so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? So in last week's passage, we were awakened or reawaken to the fact of persecution from the hate of the world. Jesus told us, rather warned us, about the world around us, that the world would continually behave in a way that was contrary to the way and life of Jesus. Now today, this morning, and just mere minutes really in that time with the disciples, Jesus reminds the disciples and us that he is going to the Father, the Father, the one who sent him. Through these chapters that we've been going through, Jesus in his compassion and mercy has told these men that he is leaving. But up to this point, he hasn't quite addressed the full emotional impact that this will have on his followers up to this point. Now he does. Verse 6 says, Rather, you are filled with grief, filled with grief because I have said these things. The things in this verse that Jesus is talking about is not the hate and persecution from the world, but rather the going to him who sent me. Grief is flooding the hearts, and I'm sure the eyes, of many of the disciples because Jesus is going. You see, the primary reason for grief is not a persecution from a world that doesn't follow the ways of our Savior, but rather the primary reason for grief is the disappearance of the God-man. Jesus would be absent. Now for us on this side of the cross, in the year 2020, where we have the luxury of reading and experiencing much of the power of the resurrection, It may be easy for us to brush away the grief of the disciples. And yet, I just want you to think about it this morning. Close your eyes if that helps you focus. Think about In fact, this grief is so much that our English language doesn't give it the justice it deserves. Originally, this grief meant a grief that actually affected the whole body. So much so that at times it would actually give your whole body physical pain. Jesus was leaving. But even in the grief, there was a necessity to his leaving. In fact, Jesus says something here that is hard to believe. Let's follow along here. Verse 7, he says these words. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. It is for your good that I am going away. Wow. Does that mean that God wants us to be filled with grief all the time? Or is there something larger at play here? This past week, I was talking to a pastor friend of mine in the area, and we were talking about the gospel. And he mentioned that many of these non-believers, non-Christian friends that he's talking to, believe that if they received Christ 
any kind of joy or happiness would be absolutely non-existent. That to believe the gospel meant to pursue joyless things. If that's you, if you don't believe in Jesus this morning, whether you are here or online, I want to challenge you. Even for those of us in Christ this morning, those of us who have been Christians for many, many years, receiving Jesus doesn't mean we are called to be even more miserable than those who don't believe. No, although these disciples were being filled with grief, as Jesus says, he has an answer to this deep grief. Let's look at the second half of verse 7 there. He says, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You see, the necessity of the leaving of Jesus comes answered in the form of the advocate who has been mentioned in the past couple chapters quite a bit, actually, as the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Truth. In some translations, he's called the Counselor, mentioned quite a bit. The answer to the greatest kind of grief for the Christ follower, whether it be 2,000 years ago or now, is the Spirit, the Advocate, the one who advocates for you. If you want to have your Bibles open, flip to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 22 to 27. This is my favorite passage about the Holy Spirit. I want us to read this first because I think it helps frame our minds right as we get further into this passage in John. Romans 8, 22 to 27. Paul says this in Romans. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is not seen, that is seen, is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. See, in our life and our prayers, God intercedes for us in the Spirit. He is no half-hearted intercessor who only does it a little bit of the time. He is the Spirit. And that is where we come to now in John 16. So flip back to John 16 and our first description about the Spirit. In fact, you could almost say that the whole message comes down to this point. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit works right now. Verses 8 to 11. Let's read that chunk of John 16, 8 to 11. Jesus says, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Firstly, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, is a he. Jesus says when he comes, he will prove the world. And that goes on, he, he, he. The Spirit isn't an it. Although we often call the Holy Spirit an it, because in comparison to the Father and the Son, the Spirit seems to be less visible. And yet Jesus says the Spirit is a he. The Spirit is personal, exactly like the Father and the Son, a personal God. One of the reasons that we, and when I say we, I mean the the global evangelical church, doesn't take seriously or sometimes doesn't even mention the Holy Spirit, is because we often don't consider the Spirit to be an actual person. Sometimes we think that the Spirit is less personal than the Father. Perhaps we think of Jesus as the most personal, or he was a, a physical person, walked here on the same earth that we do. 
But today we're going to be challenged by God's word, that the spirit is actually personal, a person. Here are three things which the spirit does, and three things that help us have joy, even in the midst of grief. Number one, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin. Number two, righteousness. And three, judgment. You see it there in your Bibles. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. These are three things the Spirit will do to the world. It says the world. Later on, we'll see what the Spirit has to say to us as the church. First, let's think about and examine the Spirit's work with sin. Jesus says this again. About sin, because people do not believe in me. So one of the great things about this passage is that Jesus helps us see the reasoning behind these three things. We don't have to guess why he said sin, because he said it right here. Because people do not believe in me. The Spirit comes into the world to prove the world wrong about sin. But that makes us ask the question, what does the world actually believe about sin? About sin. In one sense, the world